Amen. Well, welcome to Cuff United Methodist Church, and we are glad you are here in worship with us this morning, where you are invited to come, connect, grow, and serve your roadmap to meaningful purpose. You are welcome here, no matter where you have come from and no matter where you are going, no matter what you believe or doubt, no matter what you have or don't have, and no matter who you love. All of you is welcome into this time of worship by God who loves you, knows you by name, and wants a personal relationship with you. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So on announcements, since I haven't been around for <laughs> three Sundays, I don't know if there's I don't know what announcements there are, except the announcement I'd like to make, which is a great big thank you to you. Um, for the cards and gifts and the surprise of my family uh, in the last Sunday of Jews for my retirement celebration. Um, I was gobsmacked, right? I just was not expecting that. And um, so some, so y'all can keep a secret. <laughs> I had no idea. I was really for it. And I thank you for it. I thank you. It's so appreciated. So that's my announcement. Are there any others? None? Well, why don't we center our hearts as we prepare for worship? Hear these centering words. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God, but the faithful prove the foolishness of these words, not with their words, but with their actions. So I'm going to ask you to please stand as we begin our worship in praise and prayer.
God of steadfast love. Fools say in their heart there is no God. But may our words and our very lives prove that we are not foolish. May our faith be as constant as the North Star. And may others know that we are Christians by our love. Amen? And amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the second book of Kings, chapter 4, verses 42 to 44 from the Common English Bible. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God some bread from the early produce, 20 loaves of barley bread and fresh grain from his bed. Elisha said, Give it to the people so they can eat. His servant said, How can I feed 100 men with this? Elisha said, Give it to the people so they can eat. This is what the Lord says, Eat, and there will be leftovers. So the servant gave the food to them. They ate and had leftovers in agreement with the Lord's word. Our second reading comes from, the, comes from John 6, verses 1 through 21 of the Common English Bible, Feeding of the 5,000. After this, Jesus went across the Galilee, Galilee Sea, that is the Tiberias Sea. A large crowd followed him, because they had seen the miraculous signs he had done among the sick. Jesus went on the mountain and sat there with his disciples. It was nearly time for Passover, the Jewish festival. Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him. He asked Philip, Where will we buy food to feed these people? Jesus said, to test, said this to test them, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, More than a half year's salary worth of food wouldn't be enough for each person to have, even a little bit. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said, A youth here has five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that for a crowd like this? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There will be plenty of grass there. They sat down, about 5,000 of them. Then Jesus took the bread. When he had given thanks, he distributed it to those who were sitting there. He did the same thing with the fish each getting as much as they wanted. When they had plenty to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover pieces so that nothing will be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves that had been left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw that he had done a miraculous sign, they said, This is truly the prophet who is coming into the world Jesus understood that they were about to come and force him to be their king, so he took refuge again, alone on the mountain. Jesus walks on water. When evening came, Jesus' disciples went down to the lake. They got to a boat and were crossing the lake to Capernaum. It was already dark and Jesus hadn't come to them yet. The water was getting rough because of a strong wind was blowing. When the wind had driven them out for about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the water. He was approaching the boat, and they were afraid. He said to them, I am. Don't be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and just then the boat reached the land where they had been down. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our song of response is cornerstone.
the sermon is about nothing will be wasted or nothing will be lost. But as I was preparing for this, and I had gotten these re responses that talked about the fragment of our lives would not be lost because of God's graciousness, um, but the, the text didn't land, land me to go there, but, but I was thinking about it. I was thinking about the fragments of our lives. What it might be uh, to look at our lives in segments, like as a youth, as a youth going to high school, and where were we? Were they the popular kid, or were we the one that if a team, if there was team sports, we were the last chosen, or if we went to the dance, we were the wallflower, or were we the popular kid? I'm thinking about the fragments. Were we bullied? And if that were so, if we were somehow alienated in that part, how God can use that for you to be more inclusive, for you to be more sensitive, for you to be more generous. Amen? And so then I'm thinking about young adults. Now, I don't know about you, but my young adult, I did a lot of things that I wouldn't do now. <laughs> Too old to do them, first of all, but some of them are, you know. So, uh, you know, think about your young life. And I don't know how your how you knew was. If you went to college, you went to work, or, you know, you, you took off, you traveled, whatever. But think about that span of life until you turned about 21. And, and what happened? Were there things uh, in your in your life? Did you, did you go to school? Did you finished? Did you go into the service? Did, were you traumatized if you went in service by, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress because of what you witnessed as you were in war? I mean, think about that. And maybe if that's your case, then maybe God would have you be a, a peacemaker, right? Because, uh, or work uh, with folks that, that are struggling and have those uh, traumatic stress and be more understanding. But what about our young adult age? A young adult age. Um, did you get married? Uh, maybe not. Did you get divorced? Maybe so. Um, what What happened in that fragment of your life? Was it all good? You know, were there losses? Were there gains? What happened? What fragments could you look at that God could use to enhance your life and for you to become a disciple that lives in abundance because of God's grace? And then there's adult, middle, you know, middle age and senior adult. Well, one thing we're losing, uh, let's see, how can I put this? Uh, we don't walk as fast. <laughs> We might be losing our mobility. Some of us might be losing some of our cognitive functions. Some of us, because our, our eating habits might have, a, uh, you know, high blood pressure or diabetes and, you, and, and any myriad of things. Some of us might be recovering from alcoholism. You know, I'm not trying to talk about all the negative things, but I'm saying there are fragments of our life that God can use uh, so that none is lost, that your life is not wasted. Those things that happen um, can be used for God's glory. Amen. So that's that part of the sermon. Now we'll get to where I'm going. All right. Um, food miracles. Anyone who does not understand biblical miracles of food multiplication have never been to a church potluck. <laughs> Am I right? Am I right? It does not matter if the church is full of parishioners with too much money uh, to spend or not enough. Churches of all kinds typically have the problem of having too much food rather than not enough. Every church kitchen ought to have plenty of takeout containers for this reason and a healthy belief in miracles. Can I get an amen? Because we know that's true. How many people have been to church potluck and took some of that food home? Right? We know, we know it's always more than enough. And we always fret number. Oh, are we going to 
don't have enough. Uh, no, you know, did somebody bring this guy? Did somebody bring this? Uh, I don't know. You know, we fret and bring hands, and there's always enough. It is always enough. I remember when I was in Toledo at Collinwood Church, and we were a church that was in in decline and and not attached to the community because this, you know, we were in the city, and so. Um, uh, one of the churches uh, closed and gave it gave their building to um, to an alcohol and recovery agency, and they had they had weekly meals for the community. So our church, because we knew it was small, we just took the fifth Saturday, right? Because it's four of them. We just took that, and you know, and then we were. You know, um, sometimes it'd be 35, sometimes 45 people to feed. Now, you know there was some hand wringing there, right? We always struggled. Do we have enough? We always had enough. Always had enough. Sometimes, sometimes just enough, so everybody said, and sometimes more than enough. So we've seen those kind of miracles, right? Faith communities experience multiplication miracles all the time, and yet they often find other ways to explain what happened, you know, crediting effective event planning uh, or some other human initiative, right? Um, whether food is multiplied magically or simply shared, the miracle is, right, that all are fed. And so the story of Alicia's Feeding the people demonstrates two universal truths. First, that there is suffering and need in this world, and in this case, it's a hunger. The second, that God's blessings are more abundant than we often realize. We see God's abundance in the midst of scarcity. The people eat, and there is food left over. So what this text tells us, as well as the text from John, is that God's abundance is capable of appearing in the midst of our need. There is a song we used to sing at the AME church that I grew up in. And here's the, the lyrics. It says, you can't be God's giving, no matter how you try. The more you give, the more God gives to you. So just keep on giving because it's really true that you can't beat God's giving, no matter how you try. Can somebody say amen to that? Because it's true, isn't it? We can't beat it, right? The, these readings confirm that God's heart is with those who suffer in this world. God hears their cries and calls his disciples to act with generosity of faith. But we may react to all the suffering in the world the same way that Elisha's servant and the disciples of Jesus. Skepticism that what they have is enough to meet the need. I believe we can look at Jack's closet to see God's abundance at work. Starting with a little funding and a meager supply of clothing and being in the corner in the back of the fellowship hall, Jack's closet has been blessed beyond everyone's expectations. And the blessings continue, don't they? They continue. And they have so many donations that they can help supply other closets with clothing so that nothing is wasted. Praise be to God. That's a miracle in happening. You ought to go down there and work if you want to see it happening. It is a miracle. And, and we believe in miracles. So what we learn from 2 Kings passage is that in the midst of human need, a man arrives and generously offers the best of what he has to the prophet. And the prophet, with eyes of faith, offers it to the people of God. And the result is beyond any reasonable expectation. And that is the point. God is at work beyond our expectation. Scarcity. 
meaning that there is not enough. Not enough food, not enough clothing, not enough money, not enough people, not enough health care going on and on and on. You get it, right? And I liken this to those who see the class half full versus those that see it half empty. Scarcity mentality leads to hoarding. Remember that toilet paper run at the beginning of the pandemic shut down, right? People were hoarding. They weren't leaving enough for everyone to have some toilet paper. They were, and there was a man that hoarded off that toilet paper and then he couldn't sell it fully for him. But here's the thing, here is the thing. Um, working out of scarcity does not leave room for God's miracles of abundance. Anybody here have relatives that um, went through the Great Depression? Really? Are those the people that save everything, right? Why? They went through a great depression when there was a scarcity of resources. And so now that there's prosperity, they're still living with a scarcity mentality. I remember my grandmother, bless her heart, she, she lived and had one dog, one. When she died, we found that she had 25 bags of 25 pound dog food. She had closets, you know, small little pantry closets full of canned goods. She lived through the depression. And so to her, you know, she wanted to make sure she had enough just in case that happened again. Amen. Right. But, um, Working out of scarcity does not leave room for God's miracles of abundance. Scarcity mentality is fearful and worrisome. The fears of scarcity and chaos can be neutrally, neutralized by Jesus because what does he say? Be not afraid. He says, do not be afraid. I am. Do not be afraid. And how often in scripture is that phrase given to us? Do not be afraid. Well, will the modern, modern day disciples of Christ be paralyzed by the impossibility of the task? Or will they present what they have, however meager, and have faith that Jesus can make a miracle out of it? Well, Walter Brueggemann introduces us to the notion, the myth of scarcity in the midst of abundance. He observed that the majority of the world's resources pour into the United States. And as we Americans grow more and more wealthy, money has become a narcotic to us. We hardly notice our prosperity or the poverty of so many others. Brueggemann says that we believe more in the myth of scarcity, so we have to get more. Thus the rich get richer. The poor get poorer, and the middle class is caught in the middle. Now, Jesus transforms his followers' focus on scarcity with an experience of God's abundance and the sufficiency of what they had when they offered it and shared it with the hungry. But I wonder about modern day. I, I, I read this. I. I thought about including it, but I'm going to try to remember it from, from memory. So one of the, the scholars said, I wonder what contemporary Christians would do if on their, if, if there were 5,000 people that needed to sit down on their lawn. He said, well, probably the trustees might be concerned about the landscaping. And maybe the fine, you know, and then the food, and then the finance committee might be concerned about whether there was enough money to purchase food for all those people, you know. And and then um, what? What other other committee? And uh, the administrative council might say that you know it's inappropriate and get these people off the land because that's not what we're here for. The point is. that we don't expect the miracles. We're, we, we come to church, we do our due diligence, we, we contribute our tithes, 
We work in Jack's Closet. We were providing food. We, we do the good deeds, but we do this sometimes in our own effort and don't expect God's miracles. Rebecca Simon Peter says we need to dream a Jesus-sized dream, which means what we want to do is so big that we can't do it on our own. We have to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit and with Jesus. God has to be in the mix. It is out of what we offer that God's abundance will show up when we think we're not enough and we don't have enough. Well, what about us individually? Are we enough? In the long trajectory of our lives, does God's multiplication factor in our lives? In ministry, Jesus can take what we offer him in the sum of our service as deficient as these may be and use them to feed the multitudes so that there are leftovers and nothing is wasted. Jesus can do that in our lives. All our doubts, our fears, our shortcomings, our, our imperfections can be utilized by Jesus to bring abundance into our lives and abundance to our neighbors so that nothing of our life is wasted. When placed in the hands of Jesus, human weakness becomes more than enough. Beloved, we are challenged through the gospel story to believe that generosity and trust really can help us to enjoy shared abundance and navigate the storms that will, we will inevitably face. God's abundance is capable of appearing in the midst of our need. You can't beat God's giving, no matter how hard you try. We will be filled and there will be leftovers, but nothing will be wasted. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. God, our world desperately needs your compassion and grace. The worst storms, Jesus, are the ones caused by our fear. When we grow afraid of losing our power, or we grow suspicious of the power of others when we refuse to acknowledge your mysterious authority. Yet it's in the storm that we find our capacity to love. In releasing our weak claim to power and opening to your reign, we discover a new way of seeing ourselves as called and useful and beloved and the other, whoever they may be, as dignified and precious and beloved. So here in this storm, Jesus, we need you, and we need each other, and the love you give us to share leads us through sacrifice and self-giving to peace and calm, if only we lose our own own fear. And in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen? Amen. We'll have a song of response.
come as you are. I'd like you to join me in the prayer of confession. God of our hopes and dreams, we're in. All right, please join me. God of our hopes and dreams, we are empty and long to be filled. We are hungry and long to be fed. We are lost and long to be found. Invite us once more to eat our fill and find our true nourishment in Jesus, the bread of heaven. Just as Jesus gathered up the fragments of the five loaves and two fish after feeding the five thousand, gather up the pieces of our lives and shelter us in your love. Amen. So if God's love has been lavished upon you, it is always there for you, offering healing and hope. So rest in God's love. There is forgiveness in God and a hope that makes us whole. Thank you to God. Amen. Well, at this time, we have a video from Work of the People. It's your one wild and precious life.
Okay. <clears throat> We now have the invitation to communion. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, the same day on which our Lord rose from the dead, he appeared to the disciples in the place where they were gathered and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Come then to the joyful feast of the Lord. We have prepared the table with the offerings of our confession, our life, and our labor. Let us give thanks for this gift. Emmanuel, God with us, we praise you for the glorious gift of your life, active presence in our midst. We are overwhelmed with gratitude and humbled by your intimate knowledge of us. So pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and juice. In your holy mystery, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry with all the world. All power and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The sacrament can now be received. We ask that you start from the back, come down the middle, and exit on the side. Come as you were so led. <laughs>
Jesus who gives us the bread of life. Go to walk in the ways of Christ who strengthens us in our inner being through the power of the Holy Spirit. Go to serve our living God who gathers the fragments of our lives that nothing may be lost. Amen? Amen. Go in peace.